Very good. I don't know if that one's on or not. I don't think that one's doing anything. We've been talking so much about Jesus' name that I thought we might sing another name song today. If everybody's okay with that. Number 20. We'll give folks a minute to get over. Is there anybody else coming out that way? I don't think so. Let me get my Bible ready over here, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wonder, is Julia Teller today? Oh, she'll be over. Okay. What's that? We'll give him a second. We're not in a hurry, are we? I'll give you plenty of time. You'll still be at the Baptist there. There'll, there'll be something besides chicken uh, nets and uh, feet. You'll have something to eat. That's uh, by 12.30. Dave says as long as I'm done by 12.30, we're all good. Yeah. Then you wake up. Yeah, boy, that'll be a tough time. <laughs> How many of you remember being in some services that went a long time? Some of the old ones are, yes, you've been there? What's that? My husband would always preach an hour and a half. Preach an hour and a half. Huh? How many points did he have? Like seven? Oh, three long ones. Huh? Half hour piece. How many of you, now this is going to date me a little bit here. How many of you remember there's an old fashioned thing that used to be called the fifth Sunday service? You do a fifth Sunday service and usually just have morning service and then you'd have like a dinner on the grounds they call it and then you would have like another service which everybody slept through no no but uh, and then you didn't usually have evening service how many of you ever came from churches that had Sunday evening services yeah that was so we had Sunday morning Sunday night and then Wednesday night and that was just kind of the way it was and now Wednesday night was a bit more prayer meeting Bible study in some churches, it was in somebody's home. Depends on the size of the church. If it was a smaller church, you could fit people in everybody's home. Sometimes that, that goes pretty quick, doesn't it? Like that'd be, what'd be about the maximum number you could probably fit in somebody's home for a Bible study? Maybe 10 to 15 at the most. That's, that's probably stretching it in a lot of places. It? We did. Now, when I was pastoring in Wausau, Wisconsin, um, we would have it. Now, we had to have a long living room. So we'd put a lot of chairs in there. And so we'd probably have about 20 for a Sunday night uh, Bible study, or Wednesday night Bible study. Yeah. Now, of course, now this is Wisconsin, so you've got to go with me on this. We also had the grill right outside the front door, and so we were grilling up Johnsonville broth. So as people walked in, they got a Johnsonville broth. And then, of course, inside, we have we had the bun coffee pot going. So there was coffee and broths uh, for that's a, That's quite a combination. That sounds like a heartburn special. But... Uh, that was Wednesday nights, and they had a good time with that. Well, you know, that's why the students become ministers, because you only work on Sunday. That's it, and barely that. And you just get up and talk. I mean, you know, I mean, that's about it. One day a week, maybe for an hour. I mean, mercy. What, what else you got to do? There's nothing else. Oh, is that door open back there for her? Oh, she gone. Sorry, I should have probably it open. I don't have keys, so I can't unlock. It was Miss Julie. Oh, we're going to hear about it now. When you get important around here. When I get important, then I'll... In, in college, we also had Sunday afternoon Vespas. Oh, Sunday afternoon Vespas. Hmm. So Trixie. Morning. Oh, there she is. Yep. Sunday was a full day, wasn't it? That wasn't always the most of a day of rest, I'll tell you that. But, uh, well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. Miss Julie was here a minute ago. Now she snuck off again. Brother Dave? There you go. That's the way it was, huh? Yeah, came in his little league uniform. Either the game was before or the game was after. Yeah, that's the way it worked. You know, it's just different. And it's and it's interesting because there'll be something you got to understand. There'll be a couple generations that just haven't ever seen anything like what you saw. You know, they haven't been part of like a Wednesday night or a Sunday night or something like that. So it's just, it's different, isn't it? It's different. The things that change over time. Well, do we have any prayer requests or praises today? I want you to feel free to share those this morning. Yes, sir. After 16 months of my wife being in the midget care unit, I get to take her to lunch today. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. Plus, I have to prayer there because 
because I'm not sure how they're going to react. You know, there's that. The public, you know, in a, in a, might just that's take it slow. Yeah. Huh? yeah, might just take yeah. it slow. But, you know, either way, it's at least you have the opportunity. Yeah. Hopefully it goes well, but at least you have the opportunity now. Yeah. After 16 plus, months. Plus, I got to leave about 15 minutes early, so it has nothing to do with the messenger. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> I'll just tell you, if he leaves, gets up and leaves stomping mad at him, you don't know why. No. Now, I hope you had a good time with your wife. I'm glad you're able to you. take her out for lunch today. That's so nice. Anybody else? Praise the program. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll be leaving Tuesday for two months. Oh, so I appreciate your prayers as we travel. Now, this whole room's going to be off kilter then. I mean, we're going <laughs> to. We're going to be tilting this way now. I'll have to move the camera over this way. But have a good trip and come back to us safely. Come back in the fall. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. My son had been in that motorcycle accident a month ago, and his surgery this week. And he's been in the hospital. Hmm. Our son was in a motorcycle accident, it's been about a month now, right? Yeah. And uh, had the treatment, but then had complications, but now it's on the rebound from that right. after going through the emergency room. So praise the Lord for that. For sure. Yeah. Took care of him. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Grace of God. We're not ashamed to ask for that either, are we? Yeah, we're not ashamed to ask him. Yes, sir. I don't know if the church is aware of it yet, but Dean uh, Cockrell had passed away. Yes, Dean Cockrell had been in, had he been at the hospital in the Orlando area? I think so, and I, I don't know all that went on there, but he passed away. Yeah, he was he was getting. Uh, I think he was in the second week of chemotherapy. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Passed away supposedly from. COVID, right. everybody's so, dying of COVID. Yeah, COVID or related to it. Difficult to know on that, it is that. Because there can be complications and so many other things, but be praying for the family, for their loss in this time. Anybody else? Praise is prayer request. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessings today, amen? Father, we want to thank you for this day and for all your goodness and grace. We want to thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, we thank you that we are we have a place here. We're safe. Lord, uh, able to come together, study your word, Lord, meditate on it, share with one another. Lord, we want to praise you. We want to thank you for the answers to prayer requests that we've uh, raised before, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, that our brother is able to take his wife back out today, Lord. We just thank you for this opportunity for them. I just ask you to bless them and that this would be a good experience for both of them. Lord, please help her, calm her mind and her heart and help them to have a wonderful time together today. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given Mike, Lord, as uh, he recovers, Father, from this accident, and even the complications, Lord. Thank you for your grace there, Lord, and for the healing you've given and uh, will give in the future, Lord. We thank you, Father, for healing in our bodies. We thank you for restoration. Lord, there's nothing you cannot do in healing our bodies. If you can raise the dead, Lord, you can heal anything. And Lord, we also want to thank you um, in the midst of times when you choose not to do that. You are still faithful. You are still good. And Lord, we just ask you to comfort us and increase our faith. We thank you for the comfort you've given and will give to the Cockrell family, Lord, in their losses. Lord, please be with them. Lord, we ask you to be with the Dorothys as they travel, Lord, uh, back up north and Lord, around, we just ask you to keep them safe, bring them back to us, Lord. For all that are traveling north, Lord, have traveled there, Father, please help them to reacclimate, have a good time with their families and back in their homes, Lord, and then bring them back to us again in the fall. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together around your word today. Lord, please open our hearts and our minds and touch us, Lord. Uh, draw us closer to you. May your precious Holy Spirit be with us and open our eyes. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, I did have a song here. We've been talking so much about the name of the Lord. I thought we would go with um, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. 
Um, it's not one we exactly sing a lot anymore, but it's a good old song. How many of you know this one? Um, pretty good one. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Uh, there's several along those kind of lines. Crown him with many crowns. They're just a, a worship the king. There's several of them that acknowledge um, his glory, uh, reverence for him, that basically we're trying to praise him and exalt him and recognize who he is and praise him for that. Well, let's sing uh, number 20 together. Everybody okay with that? Got 20 in your uh, books. Does everybody have a book? I want to make sure everybody's got one. Hey, while they're putting them out on the table, I'm glad to use them. How about you? Well, let's sing it. Number 20. 20. Got number 20? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. <coughs> Let every kindred, every tribe, on this terrestrial wall. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. On the fourth Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord. How many of you get that experience? Just when you start singing, you get the tickle. You ever had that? Mm -hmm. Amen. You know what? I'm glad that all he asks us to do is make a joyful noise. Amen. We can at least make a joyful noise, can't we? That's a good song. I hope that we kind of can keep these books here for a while, even if we kept them in a pile over to the side and handed them out. It's nice to be able to sing together too, isn't it? And to sing all the verses and just work through some of these old songs. They mean so much to us, don't they? Yes, ma'am. Oh, got it. Nope, there we go. How about that? She reminded me to turn. You did not want me singing with the mic on. Let me just try. You got to trust me on that. Oh, no, no, no. That'd be terrible. No, but uh, yeah, now we're back on. We're in Acts chapter number four, verse 32. Acts chapter four, verse 32. Remember last week we spent a little bit of time talking about Acts 2, or Acts 2, uh, Psalm 2, and how that's used here in Acts chapter 4. Remember the uh, kings of the earth, uh, uh, leaders are gathered together against the Lord and his anointed, or against his Messiah. And what were the what were the people in the early church thinking? They were saying, that was fulfilled. That was Herod. That was Pontius Pilate. That was the Gentiles. That was the Jews. That was everybody gathered against his anointed one, Jesus the Christ. Now with my students, by the time they're done with a semester of me, they get used to me saying it that way. I say it, Jesus the Christ. Because when I say Jesus Christ, they just think that's his last name. Okay. Sometimes they think of Jesus and his last name's Christ, and they don't really know what it means. They say he's Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the one that God has selected to be king. The way I usually explain it to them is kind of like a, when we elect a president, there's a time when they're elected and then there's a time when they're inaugurated, right? 
we know who it's going to be. They're elected, and then they actually take office. That's where we're at with King Jesus, isn't it? He's been anointed by God. He's the one, and we're waiting, and he's waiting until all of his enemies are made his footstool. Amen? And he is King of kings, Lord of lords, and he will be the once and final king, won't he? Won't that be a wonderful day? That'd be a glorious day, won't it? When King Jesus starts running things. I'll tell you what, as the old timers would say, things are going to change around here. And they will, won't they? When he's king, things will change and they will change for the better and he will rule in righteousness. To me, that's actually why some of our Christmas songs are really pretty good all year round. Um, for example, like Joy to the World is really one I kind of like all the time. Um, uh, around year round because it speaks to his rule, his reign, his reversing of the curse, his making all things new, making things right. We're looking forward to that. But all of that is wrapped up in Christ. Jesus, why was he named Jesus? Because he will save his people from their sins. Why is he the Christ? Because he's the one anointed by God to be king of Israel, to be king of kings and lord of lords. So I want to make sure that we understand that for the, the early church, for us too, Psalm 2 is important, talking about Jesus as the Messiah. And you remember that they prayed for boldness. Remember they had pressure put on them to not speak in that name. I just want to make sure we get this here. Let's uh, look at just very quickly. Uh, verse 25. Oh, we got to start here. Verse 24. When they heard it, when they heard that they'd been forbidden from speaking in his name, when they heard that they had gotten in trouble, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of, your, of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Verse 27 then explains that. For truly in this city, and what city are they in? They're in Jerusalem, aren't they? In this very city. In this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Jesus was surrounded. It was Jesus against them and them against Jesus. And who won? Jesus won. Now, this is a hard one. And you got to understand this because we are so, we're 2,000 years past the point we look at that up there as a symbol of victory, don't we? That cross. I want just, I'm going to be very gentle with what I'm going to say next. That's a symbol of death and shame. In a different time, in a different place, that could have been an electric chair. That could have been a noose. That could have been a guillotine. It was a symbol of of somebody being publicly shamed and put to death, wasn't it? But Christians claimed it, and I will cling to the old rugged cross. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Amen? How many of you remember growing up singing that song? Can I tell you one thing that scares Christians today? is to be ashamed for the cause of Christ. What about if the world doesn't like us or they try to shame us? What about if they did? You mean like they shamed him? Hebrews says we're to gladly embrace that, walk outside the camp where he's out there and be ashamed with him. Amen? Because shame with Christ is greater than the glory of this world. Amen? That's something we've almost lost, and that's something that's not easy to teach, is it? But it's shame and reproach gladly bear. What's the rest of that song go? Then he'll call us someday to our home far away, where his glory forever I'll share, right? So I embrace that shame and reproach here, and what will be over there? Glory, right? And so we'll make sure we get this. So they were gathered against him. Everybody's against him to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Could God's plan mean something bad at times for his people and suffering? That's another almost lost truth. 
are there times we're going to suffer some losses and have setbacks? It's hard. We don't like it. I don't like it. But for the cause of Christ, is it worth it? Does that make sense? And so we get this. It was according to God's plan. Some people say, well, that's plan B. No. I won't accept that. Not for a moment. It was not plan B for Christ to go to the cross. It was plan A from the foundation of the world that he would be given and he would lay down his life as a sacrifice for our sins. Amen? And that's the plan. So they were gathered. They did what they did. He had a plan. Aren't you glad that God has a plan? And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They did some tattling. Any of you familiar with that old word, tattle? You're, that's, we have a bad word. We're kind of like somebody's a tattletale. What do we mean when somebody's a tattletale? Talks about some, go tell on them, like go tell them mom and dad. Mom, dad, how many of you have heard that one? But on this one, what do they go do? Instead of them taking it into their hands, or even worse, taking it into their hearts, where do they take it? They take it to God. Because he's the righteous judge, right? I don't need to get tied up in knots over people being evil because before they were evil against me, they were evil against God, amen? And he is the righteous judge. Do we trust him? That's why I don't have to take vengeance in my hand. What did he say? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Can you trust that? Is that hard to trust sometimes? How many of you ever wanted to subcontract a little bit of that vengeance? Lord, let me take care of some of your light work for you, right? But do you understand this? Even our Savior committed his soul into the hand of the righteous judge, amen? And even when he was being done wrong, what did he say? He was actually pleading for him. What did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? In the middle of oppression, he's still seeking their good. Now, he's saying, you look at what they're doing and will you grant us to continue to speak with all boldness? They're speaking threats to make sure we're not bold. Will you keep pumping us up to keep us bold? Where they're threatening, will you keep encouraging? Where they're weakening, will you keep strengthening? How many of us have that courage today that the Lord can do that? Because does it seem like the world's threatening today? What are the threats today? Not, not to me, I mean, I haven't had any threats on my life yet this week, but you know, the week is young. I don't get used to death, death threat. Let me just say this to you. Nobody threatens to harm me. It's been a long time since anybody's asked me to step outside for anything, right? Unless they just, they're closing the business down. I, I, I don't get asked that. I'm not under threats all the time, right? What are the threats today? I won't talk to you. Cancel. We'll look bad, we'll talk bad about you. What are, are those the kind of threats we face today? Words. Unfriend you. Unfriend you. I've been unfriended. Amen. What else? Were you going to say one, Dr. Olin? Uh, if you get rid of Roe versus Wade, we're going to pack the court. Right. We'll, we'll change things to make sure we get our way. And that happens in a lot of venues right now, doesn't it? Like we're going to get our way whether you like it or not, whether you want to say anything or not. So are there still threats of a different sort? Now, praise God, there's nobody armed back there with an AK-47 telling us we can't meet. Amen. They're up there. What's up there? <laughs> but think about that. Isn't that a blessing we're not receiving those threats? Can that happen in Christians' lives today? Does it happen? Where they face real threats? And so these people are saying, you look at their threats, Lord. You pay attention to it. Grant us to speak with boldness. And we've got to ask for boldness too because the threats can work on us, don't they? We don't want to be thought of as bad people. We don't want to be thought of as crazy or some lunatic fringe. We don't want to be thought of as fill in the blank, right? But folks, we've got to stand for what is right, what is true. Amen? We just must. But we need God's grace to stand there, don't we? That boldness to speak. While you stretch out your hand to heal. Don't you love the way the Bible says things? I love a good translation like that. It's so 
physical at times. Stretch forth his hands. And that's what we actually see like in the book of Exodus. His hand, like he's rolling up his sleeve, Brother Dorothy. He's getting ready to do some serious work, right? And we get, you're putting forth your hand. These miracles are looked at as the hand of God coming into our world. Does God still stretch forth his hand? Would we be willing to ask him to do that? Lord, would you stretch forth your hand? Why, let me just, I won't go out of the camera, but you know, some of you, maybe I've prayed for you, would put a hand up here. Why am I putting my hands? Well, they did that in the early church, but as I put my feeble hand on you, what are we actually asking? We're asking the Lord for him to put his strong hand on you. Amen? We're asking, Lord, will you stretch forth your hand to do something? That signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So they prayed for boldness. They continued to speak with boldness. That's where we left off. Now, you can imagine we're going to have some complications. There's always trouble in paradise, isn't there? And we're going to see some. Now, this is good. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. What does that mean? That we, we get the picture there, but what is that talking about? One heart, one soul. Unity. Unity, what's that? They were united. There's unity. They're thinking about it the same way. They've got the same focus. It's a blessed thing, isn't it? When people are unified and have the same vision, the same beliefs, the same values. Have any of you ever been part of a group that was like that? That you truly felt the people sitting next to me believe the same things I believe. We're not identical. We're not carbon copies. It's not like that. But they believe the same things. They think the same things are important. Have you ever felt that? There's a unity there, isn't it? And it's also, there's a clarity. We know what we believe and we know what we need to do, right? There's what we believe and we know what we need to do. They're one heart, one soul, and that showed up in something. Now this gets people nervous. I just wanna make sure I get this. This has made people nervous for years and years. I'm gonna hope that we can help with the nervousness of this and understand some things. So are you ready? And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now, this is not the first time we've heard this. We've talked about this before. Would you look back with me really quickly at the uh, end of uh, Luke chapter 2? I will just bring it up in another screen here. Luke chapter 2 and uh, beginning about uh, verse 42. This is, I'm sorry, Luke. Acts, mercy. He's the author, that's true. But Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That's terrible. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is after the people had heard the sermon of Pentecost. They've been baptized. There's souls that have been added to them. Look what we see here in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. What did they do? They devoted themselves to it. Hmm, I don't want to preach, but I got to just say this. Don't we want a church of people that devote themselves to the right things? Not that we coerce them, not that we guilt them into it, but people that are devoted because they have the same beliefs, the same values, the same priorities that the Gazentite, that they are devoted to the same things. Devoted. Devoted is different, isn't it? Now, I can come over there. You know, that highlighter, sister, that's a, that's a nice highlighter. I've always wanted a highlighter like that. I can lay heavy hints, right? Like what I want. What about if it's just a free, no, I don't know, I'm trying to get this, thing. <laughs> you can keep your highlighter. But when somebody says, I want you to have this, I've seen a need, I want you to have this. I understand this, this is from me to you because I care about you and I seek your welfare. Do you see the difference there? But it's also the same, same thing in devoting things to God. Lord, I'm not here because it's a checkoff that I got to spend time with you. Lord, I need to spend time with you. I want to spend time with you. Spending time with you is important in my life. Not because it's a checkoff and not that anybody will ever see this, 
but Lord, I just need more of you. Amen? Devotion in prayer, in praise. That's what we're talking about. They devoted themselves to these things. They willingly gave themselves. They presented their, that, that sounds like Romans chapter 12, right? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. He doesn't want me to die right now, amen? He wants me to live for him. He wants me to present myself alive, my life to him. We've got plenty of songs like that, don't we? How many of you, we used to sing when I get, I think my, some of my first pastor, uh, the folks got a little aggravated when I changed the songs. How many of you remember an old song called I Surrender All? And then of course, when I get preaching, you go from preaching to meddling. I say, I surrender most. I surrender about 50-50. I surrender quarter on a good day. No, <laughs> that would be a different song, wouldn't it? Right? And, but we have many songs like that that talk about surrendering and presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Can anybody think of another song that we have like that that talks about presenting ourselves or doing his will? I think if there's one that Brother Dar uses us many times. What am I thinking of, Miss Jan? Um, Consecration. Yeah, there's what what are some of our consecration songs? I'm, I'm, there's one on the tip of my tongue. I can't, I've got to get a lyric. I guess. Have thine, own way. have thine own way is one of them, isn't it? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay, right? So we've got songs that get across that idea of I want you to have me to do what you want to do through me, in me, right? That idea of devoting. Now, this is wonderful. If you think of another one, pop that out there. I mean, if there's other consecration songs, sanctification songs like that, uh, devotion songs. I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I in the arms of and be closer, drawn to thee. And of course it is, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. And then it's, consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. And so we think about those songs and talk about that devotion, right? We're willing here to serve him. Jesus is called a servant and his people model themselves on that. We want to be your servants too. We want to serve. All came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Remember, we talked about this. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, I want to stop there for a second. Was it still their possession? Yeah, totally. It was still their possession. And they willingly were doing that based on somebody else had need. This was not, and I want to say this, this isn't picking on any monastery, but uh, ancient monasteries, when you submitted to that order, you basically turned over your worldly possessions. That became the monastery's possessions to do with as they were going to do. That's not what was going on here at all. It's still their possession, still their Chrysler town and country. But if they said, you know what, I could get by on a lesser car. Other people have got needs. I'm going to go willingly sell that and I'm going to share that with them. Does that make sense? It's theirs. Private property doesn't go away. It's not that they quit having things. It's that they willingly share what they have as they see people have need. Does that sound like a good way to do things? I mean, don't we have that too? Now, sometimes churches institutionalize it. And what do we call it in the church? And maybe some of you have had different ways of saying it in church over time. What have you, like, what's that? Missions. That's when we're thinking about giving out there to the needs of the people on the field or as they spread the gospel. Amen. How about like that we do the uh, five, on, uh, five on the first or something like I come up from cir circles that called it benevolence fund the deacons fund, the mercy fund, something like that where there's a need 
and we don't really have time to convene everybody later this month. They're, they've got a need right now. Any of you heard of something like that? And so you've got deacons or a benevolence committee that decide, you know something, we want to help, and so let's do that. People have given for this purpose. Please receive this, and may it help you and bless you in what you're going through, right? Does everybody familiar with that in the church? We've got that sort of thing too, okay? So I just want to make sure we've got that idea. It's still theirs, isn't it? It's their possession to do with what they're going to do with it. That's, go ahead. So for those who push socialism, they use these verses. Yeah. But what you're saying right there is relevant. It is relevant. And that's what I've tried to understand, get people, don't use it. This is not about capitalism or socialism or anything. It's about people having things. And that goes back to the Ten Commandments. You shouldn't covet what belongs to your neighbor. What's in the Ten Commandments? Your neighbor has things that aren't yours, right? Your neighbor has things that don't belong to you. Don't go steal them. Don't covet them. Don't kill them to get them, right? Don't do it. They have things, you have things. But you are always totally free at any time to lay that down what you have to share it and to be a blessing to somebody else. There's no law against that, is there? No law against that at all. And so we're going to see that. Now, get back to Acts chapter 4. Whew. Mercy, are you ready? Everybody, did that make sense? I wanted to set that stage because some people totally take that the wrong way and use it to make a point that it never was there to make. So now let's come back. They had everything in common. They're sharing. They're saying, basically, we're a family. What do you need, family? If you've got a need, call me, right? Now, it wasn't call back then. Uh, send a carrier pigeon and send a messenger. But let me know we want to help you with these needs. Now, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Now, a couple things here. Do you remember what we talked about when we had to get a replacement for Judas? What was one of the requirements? Had to be a witness of all the things that Christ began to do, beginning back at John's baptism, right? And going forward to what? That resurrection. What is it they're bearing witness to? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something that helps me with my students? Um, one of the biggest things I will lean on, major on all semester, no matter what class I'm teaching, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact. So now at that moment, you've got to decide whatever you think about Jesus, if this guy really rose from the dead as a historical fact, what are we going to do with his words, with his works, what people said about him? We better pay attention to them. Amen. But that's a critical thing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the linchpin. I also tell people this, and you might not like it that I give it away, but I think we ought to. Over 1 Corinthians, we can tell people exactly what the Achilles heel of Christianity is. Paul tells them, he says, if Christ is not risen, then we're preaching a lie about Christ. We're preaching a lie about God. We're, you're still in your sins. And we're of all people most miserable because we've only got a hope in this life. We're believing a fairy tale. There's no power. He gives them the Achilles heel. If Christ actually stayed in that tomb, then that is game over for the whole New Testament. You know what I mean? That's, and I believe that. If he was not raised from the dead, then the apostles were liars. Paul was a liar. And Jesus really is not seated at the right hand of God coming back someday. He's not. If that were the truth. But what does Paul go on to say? But he has been raised from the dead. Amen. That's a fact. And so we, we sometimes brush over this. Oh, they're giving their testimony. No, they're saying, I've seen this guy actually rise from the dead. That shows that he truly was all that he said he was. He had the power of God with him. And actually, he was the son of God. You need to trust what he did. They're bearing testimony. They're witnessing about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And what do you see on this? This is an interesting picture. And great grace was upon them all. What is grace? We got to make sure we get that down. I think it's to be a slippery term. We like to sing grace, grace, God's grace. What is grace? Um, 
unmerited favor of God. And, and let's and I like the unmerited favor. That's kind of what I grew up learning it as undeserved. Um, if it was because I did so good, then it's actually a paycheck, right? If it's because I worked, then God owed me. God didn't owe me anything, did he? That's a wonderful thing just to get in our minds. God owed me nothing, but out of his great love and his mercy, he's done all that he's done for me. Now, some, and I've had people, I remember one time in the, I was doing a jail Bible study. <clears throat> we were talking about this and he says, well, you're making it sound like, you know, that there's people that deserve it less than others. I said, oh no, brother, no, no, no. Let me, let's get this straight. Everybody's equally deserving and none of them deserve it. He was, you could tell he was like really struggling with that because what he had in his mind, he was thinking, oh, there's people that deserve it, but these people deserve it too. And what I was actually trying to get across to him, this is offensive to a lot of people. This, this action probably would get people to try to take me outside. Nobody deserves it. That's why it's grace. You're a good person starting off. You didn't deserve it either. Jew, no. Gentile, no. That's why it's grace. Amen. It's out of God's goodness, not out of something in me. You might say, well, that makes you sound pretty low. No, it makes me sound pretty blessed. Amen. Because he didn't owe me that. I didn't have that coming, but we can rejoice because we've got something. We didn't work for it. We didn't earn it. And I said, well, but, 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 but friend, I wasn't even here. And Jesus was already laying down his life for me. Amen. Before I was ever able to do any work, Jesus was laying down his life for me. That's out of his great love. Now, why would that bother people? Let's just step back. Because can you imagine a lot of my students today? You think some of them get bothered when I say that? You think they do? Some of them really do. Why, why would it, why would you think that might bother them? Or people today when I would say that? This isn't a trick question. I mean, just, you got any thoughts on that? Why do you think people would be so bothered by what I just said? Yeah, they think they're pretty good people and that merits some attention from God, right? Well, I was probably, they want to look at it this way. Well, I was, I was, I was coming up the stairs. I mean, God gave me a hand up, but I, you know, I was doing pretty good on my own. It's not like I was helpless. Or were we? Were we dead in trespasses and sins? Do we, and this is the part where you really get to where the old songs become pretty important. Do we believe this song? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Do we believe that? Can I just tell you, a lot of the world doesn't believe that. They don't believe. When they hear about being saved, this can, I, can I tell you this? I've got to tell you, I've got to teach ministry students this. They say, well, we just got to go out and preach Jesus saves. Good. That's a good start. That's wonderful. And then they hate it when I go to the dry race for them. Save us from what? What's the problem? A better life. Hmm. It does give a better life. Is that what he came to save us from? A not so good life. And then we got to talk about it. People know what nobody wants to talk about it, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were alienated from God by our sins. And they say, what well, makes it sound so bad on people? No, it makes him sound so good. The problem is serious. Can you imagine the ambulance come screaming up, Woo! coming up to the hospital, bust open the doors. They say, what's wrong with this guy? I don't want to say there's anything wrong with him. Wrong is such a hard term. We just brought him here. Did you? What do you mean? You, it's an emergency room for goodness sake. What's wrong with him? Nothing's wrong. His heart's not beating the way it should. Well, how much is it not beating like it should? It's not beating at all. He's having trouble breathing. Well, how bad is his trouble breathing? Well, 
he hasn't taken a breath in a while. What? Well, start CPR. Amen. Get some oxygen, code blue. We've got to get this person some help. Amen. But to get somebody help, we have to admit that they actually need help. Amen. And that's what's the hard part about today is because nobody wants to say to people on our own, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're separated from God by your sins and you won't make it out of this without Jesus. Can we just say that? And that's and that just seems almost impossibly hard for people to say today that we actually have a sin problem. And they want to focus so much on the bad news. That'll make people feel bad. The next thing you say is going to make them feel good. That there's somebody who gave his life as a ransom for those sins. There's somebody who died for those sins. There's where sin did abound. Grace did much more abound. There's good news with this. Jesus is the answer. And Jesus saves. Because we needed saved. Because we could not save ourselves on our own. Friend, we've got to get this straight. There's grace upon them all. God's blessing them and giving them boldness. And he's with them in spite of all the pressures and the opposition. Can I just say this to you? If we've got a small view of grace, we've got a small view of God. And I would think that that is what hinders a lot of church work today. We've got such a small bit of God. I mean, we only call him when the lifting gets incredibly heavy instead of calling him at the very first thing and having him there every moment. We used to sing another old song. The old timers used to warm this one up. I need thee every hour. How many of you remember that song? That's become, I need thee one hour a week at max. Amen? Every hour. I need thee. I sense my own weakness. I can't do anything without you. Jesus said this, I am the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can't do a whole bunch. Without me, you can do nothing. Amen? That's why we need him every hour. Whoa. Cue the organ. What, what happened? Who slipped something in here? Gotta be careful. We got vapors coming off of that. Okay. Whew. Grace. I love preaching about grace and I love preaching Ephesians chapter two, but we're not doing either one of them this morning. So let's keep moving. So there's great grace upon all of them. Verse 34. Oh, I didn't want to skip it. Verse 34. There was not a needy person among them. Oh, that's good. The economy was doing great. Bank accounts are good. There was no needy person. Uh uh. Why wasn't there a needy person? Because they were sharing. Whenever you got a four there, it's either going to give you the because or the explanation. In this case, there's not a needy person because why? As many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. Who did it belong to? The owners. They own the, as many as were owners of land or houses. They were the ones selling them. It was still their property. They hadn't already deeded it over to the church, had they? That's not what had happened. And so when somebody comes to you and tries to tell you that kind of stuff, tell them you don't, no, no, say it nice, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so let's do this in a nice way. I think the scriptures might take us in a different direction, brother or sister. Let's look at them together. My first one, my rough Craig Miles country style was, you don't know what you're talking about. Let's clean that up. Let's make it nicey nice. Let's look at the scriptures together because the scriptures don't teach that, do they? They were owners and they sold them and they brought the proceeds from the sale. Does everybody understand what we're talking about here? Anybody here sold a house and you get the money from that. You pay off mortgages today, right? Pay off everything else. Walk home with a little bit. And then that's the proceeds. And what did they do with that? And they laid that, those proceeds at the apostles feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. Does this sound like a benevolence fund? Does this sound like that as people are in legitimate need, people are sharing? There are people that give to it. There are people that receive benefits from it. You might benefit from it now. You might be giving towards it next year. Amen. Do you, does that make sense to everybody? This is not socialism, is it? 
That is not what we're talking about here. This is not turning over the deeds to it. It's that you're giving resources to be a blessing to others that have a legitimate need. Does that make sense? I mean, I want to make sure we get that. And this is what's happening here. And so they're doing this. Now, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, that's like his nickname, uh, which means son of encouragement. Remember I told you Bar usually means son of, like Simon Bar Jonah, son, Simon, son of Jonah, Simon, uh, this would be Barnabas, son, Bar Nabas, son of encouragement. That's what he was known as. He was an encourager. That's what his characteristic was to these people. But his real name is Joseph. He's a Levite, tribe of Levi. He's a native of Cyprus. He's not from Jerusalem. What did he do? Verse 37, he sold a field that belonged to him. How many more ways can this scripture say this? Who did the field belong to? It belonged to him. It was not the church's property, right? It was not somebody else's property. It was his. And he willingly chose to sell it. And he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, that's obviously figurative, of course, what we're talking about here. What's the, what are we saying? I want this to go to help. That's kind of a different kind of old-fashioned altar, isn't it? How many of you ever seen somebody actually come to an old-fashioned altar and lay money down? I dare say most of us have never seen anything like that happen. Right? But can you imagine that the services, they're gathered together there, they've been praising the Lord, there's been a message, and somebody comes up and they leave that at the altar. Where do we leave it today? Well, we leave it in the little drop box or we leave it in the plate or we do it electronically. But do you get the concept here? I want this to go to helping people. The Lord's blessed me, I've got something to share, and they give it. Does that make sense to everybody? Does this sound good? Then there's going to be a problem. We're going to cover the problem quickly. What word did it have to start off with? But. Why is there a but there? Because we've been going along good. Things are going good. Grace is upon them. Things are being uh, done the right way. There's help being given to people that are needy. There's people doing the right thing out of a right heart. But. I want to say this to you. Because you're going to come away from thinking today, you're rough on Ananias and Sapphira. Can I tell you this? If we can't see us, each one of us, in Ananias and Sapphira in some way, then we've misread the scripture. This is going to be just laid out right now. You ready? I'm going to put, because you're going to say, oh, I can't believe he'd say that about me. Let me say it about myself. There are times when I've done things out of a pure motive. There are times when I've done things to be seen by people. Did Jesus deal with that in his own ministry? He said, there's people that go out to the corner, street corner to pray. It's not because they wanted to go out there to get in touch with God. It's because they wanted to go out there and they wanted to perform for an audience. Amen. Does that happen at times in Christianity? Can it happen? Okay. We've got to be very careful because our heart is deceitful, isn't it? My heart can run astray. I mean, in a hurry. And we see something here. This can take any of us. I need to take a warning from Ananias and Sapphira. Remember even what Jesus talked about. He said, if you're going to pray, go where? And this doesn't mean we're prohibited from praying in public with each other. That's not what we're talking about. But where should the majority of my praying be done? In private. Me talking to the Lord. Amen. What did he say? Jesus instructed us. Go into your closet, pray. And the father that hears you secretly, he's going to do these things openly. Right? But they're neat. Prayer is not performance. Can I tell you something? I've got to tell young preachers all the time or young people that want to preach. If you're going to pray, then pray. If you're going to preach, then preach. But don't mix the two. How many of you have had somebody preach a three-point sermon in their prayer? Amen or oh me. If you're going to pray, then talk to God. If you're going to preach and talk to people, keep your eyes open and talk to people. But don't act like... Don't use God as a, God, I'm not really talking to you. I'm actually talking to all these people. I'm glad that you're just there as a sounding board. None of this is actually for you. This is all actually for them. That's an insult to God. Amen. If you're going to pray, then talk to God. If you're going to talk to people, we call that something different, don't we? And we've got to separate those two things because some people just use God like they're doing a soliloquy or something. They're just doing a, I'm going to address him, but I'm actually talking to all you. 
Let's pray to God, amen? Let's be people that talk to him. They're going to do something in public to show people something. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. It's theirs to sell, right? Is there anything wrong yet? We really don't know what the butt's here for yet, do we? I mean, you got to think about somebody hearing Acts for the first time or reading Acts. They're like, why is it butt? But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. That's not a problem. Other people are doing that. What's the butt there for? And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Was that in and of itself wrong? Let's just say he sold the house for two hundred thousand. Let's go with that. He has a hundred thousand. He says, "Honey, we're going to keep back fifty thousand. Let's give fifty thousand to the church." That's pretty. That's an incredibly generous offering. But let's just say that's what he did. Is he wrong to do that? Is it if he sold it, he has to give every bit of it, the proceeds to the church? Was there anything obligating him to do that? Not at all. So he kept something back. We're still not yet to the but part. It's going to have to be revealed to us here in just a second. So his wife knows about it. We know about it now. He brought only part of it. But what does Peter say? Somebody read that for me. Verse number three. I've been doing too much of the reading. You guys get to do so. Verse three. couple things here. Thank you. Who does Peter directly say has filled Ananias' heart with this? Now, is this just exaggeration? Or does Peter really believe there is somebody, Satan, and his dark forces that can influence and push upon people and try to lead them in the wrong direction? And does that bother any of us? Now, that doesn't mean you can say the devil made me do it. Because Ananias is responsible for what he's done, right? A little bit further. Who did he say he'd lied to? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Did and he verbally say the words of the Holy Spirit? Or did the Holy Spirit know his thinking? And see, that's an interesting question. Why does, why does Peter say it this way? Can we at least say it this far? Peter believes the Holy Spirit's present and this lie more than anybody else. This isn't about the crowd. This is about you lied to the Holy Spirit. What does he say the lie is part of? Because now we'll get it. And keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. So what do we get from this? What has Ananias done? You get the idea here? He sold the property. He had proceeds. He kept some of that. But what did he represent this as? When he brings it to the the, the feet of the apostles. When he comes here, he represents it as all of the proceeds. What does he want to be? He wants to say, I surrendered all. He didn't have to do that. He could have just given the gift and walked on. Amen. Nobody was going to ask if it was 50%, 85%, 72%. Nobody's asking that. But what did he want to be known as? I want the acclaim of being a hundred percenter. Pride. I want you to think, and what does he not care about? He doesn't care whether God knows the difference or not. Apparently, Ananias had bragged to the people that he was the first thing. Everything we got, 100%. There it is. Do you get the concept here? Does that make sense? Did all, Jesus also talk about something about not doing your alms, doing your good deeds before people to be seen by them and then bragging about them? We gotta be careful about that, but don't I've got to be careful about that. I've got to be very careful. Because when we lift it up with pride, I want you to think this about me instead of no no no. It doesn't matter what you think of me. What matters is what God knows about me. At that point, does Ananias and does Sapphira, do they care at all what God knows? No. This is the audience now. They have forgotten who they're truly serving. And they're actually serving their own pride, their own reputation, and using people as pawns in it. Peter won't have any part of it. Now, is Peter rough? How many of you say Peter's pretty rough? He's rough, tough, and hard to bluff here, isn't he? Okay. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? And if you hadn't convinced the folks that disagree with you about your interpretation up to this point, 
Peter himself says this. Are you ready for it? Can somebody read me verse number four? While it remained unsold, it did not remain your own. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your hearts? You have not lied to man, but to God. Mm. This one is one I, this is incredible. First of all, does Peter confirm when you had it, it was yours? Now we, we do it slightly differently. We would not maybe ask this question this way. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? We'd probably say this this way. While it was unsold, it was still your own, wasn't it? And what do we expect? We expect a yes answer. Yes, it was still my own. What's the next thing he said? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? We would maybe say it a, a, a different way. Um, after it was sold, it was at your disposal, wasn't it? Right? Yes, it was at my disposal. He could have done whatever he wanted to with it. He could have kept back any part of it. But what does he decide to do? He decides to put on a sham. Instead of just doing the good thing and walking away, it became a production and a lie involved with it, didn't it? It turned what should have been something good and a blessing into actually something offensive to God. Can that happen? Yeah. Can even good things go the wrong way when done from a wrong heart? And God sees the heart, doesn't he? Oh, this is another one. I love this one. Again, we're not talking about this today. Wait a minute. You've not lied to man, but to God. Who did he just say that he'd lied to? Just a verse earlier. Was the Holy Spirit God? Now, you just say, well, duh, of course the Holy Spirit's God. But I want you to understand something. For the early church, that was a real serious discussion. Remember, it was already a struggle for somebody to say, yes, there's God. There's one God. There's God the Father and God the Son. There were people willing to take up rocks and stone Jesus for that, right? These people are starting to realize God's Holy Spirit, it's not an impersonal force. He is God. You've lied to God's Holy Spirit. You've lied to God. Now, just in case you didn't realize this, I do believe in the Trinity, amen? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you too, a lot of my students today, that's not even on their radar. It's a real struggle to introduce students today to the Trinity, right? Something we take for granted. The early church came to discover by progressive revelation. The Lord kept revealing more and more of himself, showing them these things, helping them to understand that. The early church got that together. We came up with a word for it, tri-unity, three in one, Trinity. But this is a powerful scripture. Somebody was asking, why do you believe the Holy Spirit's God? Right there. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God, right? Let's make sure we got that. You kept back the proceeds of the land. You didn't have to do this. You contrived this. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard them. Now, this is a hard thing. Have we already had great fear come upon people? because of miracles, even in Jesus' time? Has there been people that are amazed and in fear? I'm going to ask you something. Let's, let's do this. I want to close with this thought today. Does this trouble us that this happened to Ananias? And you wouldn't be wrong. I mean, how many of you wish this was written differently? And the Lord warned him, kind of like how Simon the sorcerer gets warned later by Peter, right? Like he gets a stern warning. Can God judge and do according to his will? And is it a serious thing to go against God? That doesn't mean that anybody that lies to the Holy Spirit is instantly going to be struck down dead. That's not what we're trying to say here. Does God have that prerogative to do what he will in that situation? And he did. 
It's a fearful thing to haul, fall into the hands of the living God, isn't it? Praise be to God, we've been delivered from the wrath to come. But we see something here. Um, he died over this. This is There's been things going so wonderful in this church. Is this a blemish? This is not what anybody wanted to come and see on a Sunday service. How many of you can imagine if that had happened today in the service? We were taking up the offering and somebody, yep, I'm giving everything in my wallet. Yep, it's going to empty out. Only the malls are going to be left in there. That's everything we have, Martha. That's our last dollar. And Pastor Chad says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit and dropped dead. How many of you do you think that would shake up a service? You know, Ananias and Sapphira are still around today. Mm -hmm. You let a church have a real revival and get their vibe really going great, and there will be an Ananias and Sapphira pop right up in the middle. Yep. It's not just what happened, it can be what happens. And can I say this? There can be an Ananias and Sapphira in here too. That I want to be known as surrendering all but I've got things that I don't actually want to surrender amen and I said you're not a very good guy you're right I'm glad you're coming to realize that I'm just going to be honest with you about it but we also have grace to not go down this path we have warnings we have grace Whew. let's finish this last piece here the young men rose wrapped him up carried him out and buried him after an interval of about three hours his wife came in not knowing what had happened Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Because why? We've already heard this at the beginning of the story. Her husband did this with her knowledge, right? Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Put him to the test. Whether he would actually call you out, whether he's listening, knows what's going on, and would actually do something about it. You have tested the Lord. What put it in your heart that you ever thought that that would be a good idea? What got into their heads and into their hearts? And can I say this? It's the corruption that can be in any of us. We have hearts that are prone to wonder. I don't know, you are all my friends. I don't want you to walk out of here saying, he must not think very much of us. No, 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 no. I just know me. You're all better people than me. But I know this, my heart is prone to wonder and to not go the right way. And that can happen to any of us, can't it? I am not down on Ananias and Sapphira. I am so sorry that this happened to them and this happened in the early church. Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. We've had amazement at the healing of the man in the temple. Amen. We've got fear at the discipline of the Lord that the Holy Spirit's with these people. You got to be careful. Two people died last week at that service. Can you imagine going back down to uh, Avon Park, Brother Dorothy, and say, would you like to come to services with us this next week? Oh, I heard last week you lost two people and they're at the offering. Can you think about that? How would that go over? How would next Sunday look? We'd come with our books open. This is not 100%. Right? This actually happened. And fear fell upon him. Amen. Amen. Where will it go from here? Now, verse 12, many signs and wonders. Remember we talked about those many signs and wonders? You grant us to continue to speak with boldness while you stretch forth your hands in healing and these signs and wonders are being done. We're going to hear more about signs and wonders. Would you please read uh, uh, through the rest of chapter 5 for next week? How about a... Uh, do all of you know Have Thine Own Way? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy
this week, let's endeavor to let him have his own way. Amen? Shake hands and be friendly, or at least shake hands. Good to see you this week.